What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. What's up? I'm Pete. And on The Stack, we talk about a bunch of books that have come out this week, sure. and we review them. So why don't we get into it? Right now, we are going to be talking about Wolverine. Wolverines! Oof. Who Number is this fresh Marvel. new character hit the scene? Let's go. Oh, great. I love a Marvel new should animal. Do... Marvel should use more of him, honestly. Wolverine number one but... from Marvel, written by Saladin Ahmed, art by Martin Kokolo. We are getting a more berserker Wolverine. And as far as I can tell, this is set before the events of Uncanny X-Men. So yep. he's bummed out about Krakoa. He's wandering the Canadian wilderness. He's tackling with some old enemies, getting some new ones. Pete! You seem stoked. Take it away. Yeah, so a couple things. One, the funny part to me is a new beginning, because I'm like, a new beginning for Wolverine? Are you serious? He was just Halverine. Uh, you know, the, this guy's been around for a really long time and done a lot of insane things. So what's new? Um, but he went back to his, uh, you know, his roots, you know, running with his pack. You know, you can't blame it. You know, after big events, some people need a reset. Sometimes you need to get naked and just run around with some wolves a little bit to feel yourself again. So I totally relate to that. I can understand the new beginnings. It's a fresh start, you know, like a how did a you feel? How did you feel about how did you feel about Nightcrawler hanging out with Wolverine fully nude? You feel like yeah, that would have come up a little what, bit? Your friends, your friends. You know, what he's I mean? a man of the cloth. It's fine. Um, mm. Ooh, that's that made wow. it. Wow, no uh, notes. I, no I, did, I did really like Nightcrawler checking up on his friend. I feel like even superheroes have to do things where, like, hey, my friend hasn't been responding for a little while. The nice thing to do would be to check up on them because I care about them. And I was like, yes, please. Yeah, people should check up on their friends. You know, we're, we're all going through a lot of shit. And every once in a while, it's nice to hear from people. So Sorry. Is this about us? Is this... Yeah, I was going to say, P, I know no. you ran loose and nude all August with your pack of deer in southeastern Pennsylvania, <laughs> and we never came and brought you your cutler clothes, and we should have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is me checking on, in on you, by the way, right? Like, the main concern I have about your mental state is, what do you think about Wolverine number one? What do you think about... <laughs> That's that a great point. Yeah. It's a great point. This is a, uh, a check. This is a, a <laughs> But check. as far as a, a new arc for Wolverine, I, I felt like this, uh, you know, does a good job of setting up this premise and getting us excited for this kind of new mountain metal that comes alive through loud noises and what that's going to mean. I mean, basically, cyber is getting an upgrade. So, oh, it should be interesting. I, I, I feel like... Uh, do, can I ask you a quick question, Pete? Sure. Who do you like better? Do you like cyber uh, from this book or cyber from uh, X Factor? Who's your favorite character? Uh, and do you I like mean, Cypher? No. Doug Ramsey or Cypher, the one with the I believe name. his name is Revelation. Uh, he's oh, also I'm a man so of the cloth. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't like any uh, buddy named Cypher. Uh, I think it's. I I think this is a solid book. Just to throw it out there, I think solid Wolverine book. Uh, mm -hmm. Good art from Martin oh, Coco. Amazing art, like, fantastic. The art. action is great. Yeah, I don't understand why they're running this and Wolverine Revenge simultaneously. Agreed. That's weird to me. Uh, well, it is Wolverine's weird. A very I mean, popular this character. So I don't know why you would think it's this weird makes sense. Yeah, do a lot of Wolverine. This makes sense as a just to have them going at the same time with very different ideas. It's just a little strange. This feels like sort of the the new beginning that the book is telling us about. I think it's funny you're making fun of the name Cyber as a villain, and it is a lame name. I feel like this character was named at a time when everyone was like Cyber, mm, like the internet. I'm going to give that a shot, <laughs> and uh, I think we could a strange villain to put here. And his whole thing is like, I'm like your bones on the outside. I hate you because of it. Or whatever, and it's that I'm, and he's just easy to to crush every time that Cyber comes around. And I think we've had a recent rash of, hey, we found a new, very cool metal in across both Marvel and DC. And I'm like, guys, let's just do with the metals we have. Mm -hmm. no, you don't uh, think it's fun to create new metals, man? I guess I, mean, I don't know. It's, fine. it's it's, but what uh, about a sleepy metal that can only be awakened with metal noises? Oh, like a sleepy time metal? Yeah. Like sleepy yeah. time tea? 
Like with the I feel like copper is a plenty cap. sleepy metal, and just let copper happen for a while, mm-hmm. guys. I I like this book. This is a fine Wolverine comic. I think if you're going to do a shot across the bow, just make the Jonathan Hickman Grun Capullo book the book. Like that's the one that feels like the standout flagship to me. It's weird to be like, here's a back to basics Wolverine adventure. Enjoy, which I do enjoy, but yeah, I don't know. Anyway, let's move on to talk about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number two from IDW, written by Jason Aaron, art by Raphael Albuquerque. In this issue, we are turning to talk, talk about, to read about Michelangelo, who is big in Japan. He has a big Mm. TV star there, getting wined and dined, but all he wants to do is eat pizza in the sewer with his brothers. And of course, light ninjas show up and attack him. I'll throw out there. I thought this was fantastic. This is maybe the best that I've ever seen Raphael Albuquerque. This was better than the first issue. I thought this was incredible. It was emotional. It was fun. The action was rad. I was like, oh, here we go at the end of the issue. Fantastic. I agree I, with you completely, and Pete, you're going to talk in a second, I'm sure, but I, I, I do have a question for you. There's a lot of talk here in this book about first getting your nunchucks out. Now, I thought of you immediately as sort of our nunchucks. Oh, yeah. Oh, guy. all the talk at the, the beginning of the book about, like, let's describe nunchucks and even calling them nunchakus. The nunchaku, like, yes, man. Oh, I'm sorry. Did a Pete write this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pete, so tell us about, before you get into Michelangelo's take, what was your experience first picking up the nunchakus? Well, I mean, obviously Mike knows what he's talking about here. Uh, The nunchaku is one of those things where you're going to put yourself through pain learning this. And I think that's a a great kind of allegory for what this book is talking about of the How many times on average did you hit yourself right in the junk? Because I think Michelangelo (laughs) doesn't have that because he has a little turtle yeah, plus he's got a shell, so that makes Don't it easier. Have, I believe they have prehensile penises, right? Are you talking about Pete or Michelangelo? <laughs> Your choice. Sorry. Ladies' yeah. choice. Ladies' uh, choice. <laughs> anyways, if we, uh, if we could, you know, um, uh, talk about this book seriously for a second, I love this. It really brings me back to the Eastman and Laird because they did do these kind of one-offs where you would spend some time with with Raph, with Leonardo, with Mikey, and the Mikey one-shot uh, taught you how to use nunchucks, the nunchakus. And I think it was just one of those things where um, I, it, I just felt very seen and very excited because I learned uh, the nunchucks from uh, the Michelangelo one-shot, and he's talking about, uh, you know, like anything in life, uh, things you want to learn, there's going to be some ups and downs, some pain that you're going to get, uh, but you hopefully come out uh, better on the other side. And I thought it was such a cool uh, thing for Mikey to talk about, you know, a little bit of uh, his weapon, why he likes it, what it kind of does well, for him. Well, I'll throw out there the reason, and Pete, you're probably going to say, how dare you at me, but the reason I think this issue worked even better than the last one is the first one you have Raphael, who... Is very intense, very angry, and he is in a situation in prison where he's very intense and very angry. So it all, like, fits. The contrast of having Mike, the party dude, being able to show the layers underneath him and why he is a great warrior, why he cares about his brothers, why he's feeling lonely, it causes so much good dramatic tension throughout the issue. Uh, Again, I just thought this was really well. Plus, it also showed a little raft side of him, too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A little bit of the rage. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I do. I think it's nice when you get to see kind of different layers of what make people tick and, and, and more about these characters. But uh, uh, I also like how they're kind of getting into their weapon and what that means for their personality and that different kind of stuff. And also, I loved how like this idea of food and, you know, company and Poisoning what is it. the greatest, no, nope, no, nope, what is the greatest meal? And usually when you think about your favorite meal, it's really about the company and the people that you're sewer eating pizza. with. Because uh, even say, sewer that's, pizza uh, that's the one thing that can be for amazing me. when you're eating with your family. Having thought, like, a prepared meal by one of the best chefs in Tokyo, I would take that any day out of sure, eating pizza in the sewer. Shit. 
Yeah. Well, let me ask you, what do you think their travel time from the wherever the pizza was left above uh, the manhole and it got back to where they were eating it? Because the uh, more time it's marinating first in the off, sewer. First off, did you not see any of the movies? They get it delivered to the sewer fresh, bro. They're not, you know what I mean? And how Come do you on. put that in the app? I mean, and they weren't using an app. You could drop a point. pin anywhere you now, You put bro. it in your Come notes. On. You say, yeah. hey, come yeah. into the sewer. <laughs> yeah. and, and you tip like 17%. I mean, let's be real. You guys have got to deliver shady places You have to check the box that says not a penny wise, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I check turtle and uh, <laughs> samurai and yes. giant rat friend on yeah. my... Uh, <laughs> Uh, speaking of which, Pete, I can't believe you haven't mentioned this, but the voice of Splinter passed away today as we were oh, man. talking about this. Are you serious? I am. Fuck. I didn't even know that. Well, there you uh -oh. go. I'm so sorry to bring that up. Devastating. That's, that's fucked up. That's like, for Pete, that's like telling him a grandparent died. <laughs> You're he just died. dropping he that on him. He died of ninjas, though. But so it's okay. He, he died. As and, he and I'm lived. sorry you're devastated, but it's time to talk about the Devastator with Transformers number twelve from Image Comics and Skybound, written by Daniel Warren Johnson, art by Jorge Corona. It's all come down to this: as Cybertron is in the sky, the Autobots and Decepticons are clashing Holy on the ground. Holy man! <laughs> I really you wrecked this, this podcast. This Peter is my day. Holy shit! I'm so sorry, Pete. Fuck, man. Look, it's like Dude, you were just said, like, I love how in Turtles, in this issue of Turtles, they built tension by taking the happy character and making him sad. <laughs> and I was just like, want me to prove it? <laughs> Got him. <laughs> One of his idols just oh, died. Dude. <sighs> oh, man. Uh, I'm so sorry, Pete. <laughs> uh, I'll talk about the issue while Pete, you have 40 seconds to mourn. Uh, this this issue of Transformers is very good. Daniel Warren Johnson is like, uh, he really gets the characters, and Jorge Corona on art, it's pretty seamless from the Daniel Warren Johnson art into Jorge Corona. So, like, yeah. I, I feel like that's been so nice. And based on the back matter here, Daniel Warren Johnson is continuing on here, so the story's going to go forward. He yes. is, just to clarify, he's going to be on until issue 24. That yeah, is nice. when he's leaving the oh, title. Oh, great. So that's great. We get more of it. It feels like that will be at least a complete portion of the story where we get to see um, Optimus Prime continually wrecked all the time by different things. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, let's back up the truck a little bit here. Uh, this uh, this cover that we're looking at is a banger. I mean, this is just epic cover. I love this so much. Uh, just so very cool looking. Um, yeah, a lot of shit goes down this ish. Also, we get a little dark side Optimus Prime here. I don't know if he kind of has a malfunction or something happens, and uh, he's straight murdering fools, which is not usually the look for him. So... That, to me, by the way, I think is the most fascinating thing about this title right now is what Daniel Warren Johnson is doing with Optimus Prime, because I think you have two yes. things going on, right? One, he ate Sam Witwicky's dad, or whatever he did to him to turn him into Energon, and that clearly is doing something to his memory. But at the same time, there seems to be an implication that attaching Megatron's cannon is also messing yeah. him up. And yeah. that's good like i'm yeah. i don't think we need to go full dark optimus prime saga or anything but taking optimus and pushing him in a direction where it challenges everything he believes is cool also without spoiling it the place this issue ends up on there they've been doing a lot of promising like this is it the issue that changes the energon universe forever and a lot of times it's like we introduced uh flash fry over in gi joe or whatever i don't oh, know man i love him <laughs> dude fuck you bro he works a lot with barbecue right mm -hmm. yep uh anyway my point being like usually it's that level this is another level of like oh it actually changes the game in a very big way so good stuff and i agree and like we're only poking fun because it is so fun it's it's a testament to how well both Transformers and the G.I. Joe side of the universe are doing. They're yeah. telling real heavy drama stories, creating real characters, while at the same time being like, oh no, snow jobs in peril. And this issue, it's like, beachcomber. And I'm like, well, it's so funny that these, these toys names are treated with, as like yeah. Shakespearean drama level as characters. And I love it. And it's funny. 
Shout yeah, out. I mean, sure, you know, the names are silly, whatever, but let's get past that already. Um, first off, I just want to say, like, yeah. I loved kind of the 80s feel to this a little bit. I mean, we got that, like, sweet action sequence where we got, like, uh, almost an A-team type van kicking ass. Um, a little shout out uh, to Murder Falcon kind of felt like that for a second, which was really cool. And then, uh, you know, we also got the... Um, Oh, uh, let's see here. Sorry, I gotta refer just real back quick. Be on the eighties side of it. Like, I think yeah. the recipe's pretty clear. Take a toy from the eighties and add more eighties shit, and what you yeah. got is a perfect. <laughs> I mean, 80s come on, stew. that surfboard was also eighties looking. I mean, come on, that was yep. badass. I'm agreeing with you completely right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Can we move to another 80s thing? And Oh, you have one more point to make, Pete. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, if this wasn't clear in our kind of ramblings a little bit, that this really does have a great package of not only uh, amazing art and action, uh, but also just some really impressive storytelling. And, uh, you know, Justin talked about it. It's ridiculous toys come to life, but it's done in, in such a great way. So, sorry, I'm beating a dead horse over here. No, that's all right. Let's talk about Star Wars number 50 from Marvel, written by Charles Soule, art by Matabek Musabekov. And this is the final issue of the series. Don't worry. There's going to be more Star Wars comics Ooh, to come. All right. <clears throat> yeah. But this is the end of this current run, the end of this era between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And Charles Soule here is, <clears throat> excuse me, telling a story of Luke Skywalker telling Ben Solo a story that kind of wraps up his time on the Star Wars series touches on a ton of other eras and ideas from out the Star Wars run. I thought this was really great. I thought this was, even if you haven't been consistently reading Star Wars, which, full disclosure, I have not, I think you could jump right into this one, pick this up. This is a 50-page mini graphic novel about Luke Skywalker and company. It plays like a Twilight Zone episode as they discover this mm. box that can kill anybody with the proper genetic material. So, of course, they argue over whether they should kill Palpatine. Um, mm -hmm. I thought it was really well done. Good, engaging story with some intriguing mythology. Well, yeah, I mean, it was it's super powerful. Um, and, you know, as a Star Wars fan, it, it irks me a little bit, you know, because you have this mm -hmm. lesson that's clearly not considered, you know, and it's very frustrating. Because uh, we know how things go, and it's like, man, I wish you would have fucking listened to this, you piece of shit. But other than that... Wait, who's the piece of shit in this situation? I believe Luke? Pete... Can I... Oh, yeah. Pete is referring to everybody else in terms of not killing thousands of people to murder Emperor Palpatine. Nope. Nope. Oh, that's I know. You're talking, talking about, about Ben. You're talking about yeah, Ben. Yeah, about Ben. That fucking yeah. piece of shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fucking... Chewbacca should choke his ass out. Anyways, I just think that this is done really well. But yeah, it's you should also read my fanfic. It's also really uh, uh, it gets you. You know what I mean? If uh, Star Wars is your thing, you probably got some opinions about it. It gets underneath your skin a little bit. But Charles Stoll uh, writes a hell of a story, and uh, it's some amazing art. Well, and I think what your your frustration, Pete, is the Star Wars universe, especially the main you know Skywalker cycle of nine movies. No. Is there's so much, so many different ideas there, and there's so many characters that you like, you don't like, are stories well told and stories less well told. And I think um, the Luke and Ben stuff that I guess takes place after Jedi, right? Or after Force Awakens, I guess more specifically. No, it's uh, after Jedi before Force Awakens. Right. So, like, that stuff, like, is an awkward time, I think, because we know that, uh, this is a spoiler for those movies, for Force Awakens, <laughs> that Ben kills right. Han Solo. Oh, and God, it's, just say it out loud. It's yeah. Such fucking and bullshit. it's such a, it's a bummer. And the way that a lot of that was told was like, ah, and then Luke becomes, like, basically a villain at points. So, it's it's strange. But I do think what Charles does well here is sort of sews it up to tell a standalone story in the universe that feels fresh. Something that we talked a lot about with the uh, Dark Droid series or uh, event that went through these Star Wars books that I think was really successful. To, to your point, Pete, telling a story where you know what's going to happen at the end with all these characters while still making it engaging and new. 
And I hope they're able to find a way to make that continue in this universe, even if they move off of these main uh, this main character yeah. point. And at. also, this is very much not apropos of this particular book, but I do want to just bring it up because it happened recently. We talked about this very briefly on the live show, but John Cassidy passed away rather shockingly this week. Uh, and I... I went back. I was just reminded of him kicking off the new run of Star Wars. Not yeah. this run, but the previous run with Jason Aaron yeah. at Marvel. Those comics are so good. So yeah. good. His Darth yeah. Vader is so badass oh God, in those it's books. Really it's yeah. insane. Yeah. So, I don't know. Again, this is not apropos of this, other than, like, this is ending one run, which made me think of another one, which made me think of John Cassidy. But, like, check out this book. Check out Star Wars 50. But also go back, read those first six issues that Jason Aaron did with John Cassidy, because they are oh. phenomenal. Real quick note about John Cassidy, too. I didn't say this in the live show, but I, friend of a friend, um, knew him pretty well. So I hung out with him at a, at a bar, I think, on two separate occasions. And oh. it was just a super chill nice dude who was just out here like this is my job it was like it was a job for him and i think that's rare amongst anyone who becomes someone so high up in the industry a star in what they do and he was just a regular dude and it was such a shock to hear that he passed so shouts awful to news yeah. awful news but why don't we move on and talk about absolute power task force seven number six from dc comics written by stephanie williams art by Kari randolph Per this title, it is following the Amazo robots that are attacking the DC Universe. This one has the powers of Wonder Woman, is attacking Themyscira. So we get to see a bunch of the Wonder Woman characters. Um, I, I gotta say, without being too rude about it, I think this is my least favorite issue of this so far. I think there was some good art here. I always like Kari Randolph, but the story felt a little convoluted to me. Well, I do think this event is, you know, it's hard in an event to be telling these stories that are tangential to the main action. And, you know, it's like, okay, this issue, we have to deal with this thing spinning out of the main event, the attack on the mascara that happened in Absolute Power 4, uh, I think. And, you know, it, it is it it isn't my favorite issue either, but I, I got to say it's still good. And I do think that the way that DC has handled the continuity of this event, I think is just really smart. Everything feels like it matters in a way that I think it's been a struggle to do with a lot of events from both DC and Marvel lately. I do feel like each of these stories, I am learning something about the event that I wouldn't have known before. So kudos to them on that. Yeah, just to negate as much as Justin said here as possible, um, yeah, I think this is uh, not a fun event and continues to not be fun in this issue. The art is phenomenal. But otherwise, I'm, I'm sick of it. And would you trace your – you just – Amanda Waller you hate, and it's, this event is all about Amanda Waller. So that's your main well, no, no, my problem. My main problem is, yeah, it's um, uh, taking a, a villain uh, that I, I don't particularly like and then elevating her to absolute power and then watching yes. her pull, pull a Terminator where all technology is against us and – it's learning about us, and will it let us live, or will it murder us all? And uh, you know, I, I just, I'm not having fun yet. I'm hope I'm keep waiting for that turn where the good guys start winning, and maybe things start getting interesting. But right now, it's not fun watching us lose and Amanda Waller win. So maybe they just won't the, win. Yeah, maybe they won't. There's absolute power. Four is coming at the beginning of next month. I have a feeling things are going to turn around, but I guess we'll see what happens. We'll see. What Literally, happens. I think I think is the title of this issue like the tide turns or something. <laughs> yeah, like something the third like one was like the grand the bit the great battle or something, and this one mm -hmm. is like like <laughs> it's basically like they're going to win starting now. So yeah. get ready for that part. Yes. The Department of Truth, number 25, from Image Comics, written by James Tyne IV, art by Martin Simmons. We're continuing the arc that is exploring the assassination of John F. Kennedy Jr. by Lee Harvey Oswald. And this issue, per it being a 25, a big anniversary issue, not only wraps up that story for the moment, but also lays out a huge amount of mythology for this series, things that are happening in the background. It is quite literally a game-changing issue uh, here and 
it's incredible. Like I cannot say enough things about this, both from the writing perspective in terms of how James Tynan is exploring and changing the idea of how this title approaches truth and conspiracy series, but also Martin Simmons from the art perspective, every issue is just the mo- is better than the last issue. Uh, the stuff that he lays out here is incredible, and particularly the things that they explore in this per- issue about perspective when it comes yeah. to Lee Harvey Oswald, mild spoiler here, but he feels the perspective of everybody in the moment before JFK is killed. That's sort of the point of the series, and both James and Martin crush it. Yeah, I'll, I just want to shout out the guest artists in this issue. Uh, did like a page or so each. Jorge uh, Fornes, uh, Alicia Charretier, uh Tyler Boss, John J. Pearson, David Romero, uh, Allison Sampson, Jordi Belair. It's really cool to see that stuff um, sort of in the back third of the book. But yeah, I mean, I love this book. It's such a smart use of the premise, which is sort of, if you had to elevator pitch this, it'd be like all those conspiracy theorists, theories out there, they're real. But really what this book is showing is there's a belief system behind this that makes it real. So that makes it super topical to our society right now. But at the same time, it sort of throws cold water on conspiracy theories in general because there's no order to them. Like there's no like mastermind. It's a mess. And that's what I believe like conspiracy theories are meant to make sense of a messy universe. But I think the point is that it actually is a mess. And the fact that this book sort of comes in on, on a premise that uh, of conspiracy theories are real and true and organized and gives us that message that is more real, at least to me, I think is an amazing turnabout that they just keep pulling off in this book. Yeah, I mean, just to echo a little bit of what's being said here, uh, artistically, this is fucking impressive as shit here. I mean, this is really unbelievable i mean the panels there's this like splash page fight sequence kind of weird tripped out thing that's unbelievable it's just uh, impressive i feel like there should be college classes on art uh and uh just uh, showing what can be there are college classes on art (laughs) a lot of art great (laughs) Well, good. If Thanks. you named it art, I bet there's a class on it if you're looking for it. Yeah, well, I just think if someone's talking about comic book art and uh, art, art Well, is... just to interrupt Pete, I feel like there should be college classes on writing. What do we think about that? Nope. No, nah, it comes from it. the heart, Alex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it comes from the heart. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just think that this uh, book artistically is just so fucking impressive and that, um, yeah, the story gets crazier but also starts to make more sense. It's... It's impressive on a lot of fronts, and, and, and it's a hell of a ride. Avengers Assemble, number one from Marvel, written by Steve Orlando, art by Corey Smith, kind of spinning off of the recent Blood Hunt arc that Jen Blood McCabe Hunt! Is. The Blood Hunt! Miss it you. continues. Miss you, Blood Hunt. The, the Blood Hunt. You missed the Blood Hunt, Pete? <laughs> oh, man. Remember those days? Well, uh, uh, get, get ready, because we're going to talk about buckle it. Buckle up! Stack. Anyway, Captain America loved putting together a team, so that's what he does here. It's sort of like Avengers Unlimited is essentially the idea where he's like, anybody can be an Avenger and I'll recruit different people at different times. So he's going off on a mission with Shang-Chi, Monica Rambeau, and somebody else. (laughs) Uh, Uh, Yes. Should be right on the cover that uh, we got there. Sure, it's it's not. In fact, it's not Hawkeye. No, it, what's crazy about this book is the character reveals throughout are shocking. Um, it's Wasp. Wasp. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so they, that gross they go snot off, rocket move with yes, Wasp. They go off yeah. on a uh, mission to stop Sin, the daughter of Red Skull, while a bunch of other characters gather at Avengers Mansion and just kind of hang out and play cards. And I, I love this. Like, I love... I thought that Jed McKay arc was great. It really got to the core of Avengers in a way that I haven't been getting from a bunch of the other stuff. And this is Steve Orlando doing what he does best, which is, yep, I know the Imagine era perfectly. I know Jarvis perfectly. They got to wear jackets. I'm going to put them in jackets. Here we go. So it scratches that nostalgia-ish in a very fun way. 
Well, and I, I just want to shout out the pace at what this story moves. Oh, like, man, you yeah. jump in, and it's like Captain America be like, hey, here's what's up. We got to go right now. And then everyone's <laughs> going, going, going the whole time. And even the people who are playing cards, like, hey, guess what? Night Thrasher's here. Didn't expect to see that. He's got <laughs> clothes for us. Just like Nightcrawler and Wolverine. Everyone's getting dressed in this stack. <laughs> and it's like, it's a cr- the pace of this is so crazy. And I think a lot of comics strive to achieve this pace and just don't even come close so shouts to this team for getting it yeah yeah i agree it's uh it's fantastic the pacing the action all the things going down i mean the the snot rocket uh was a little uh, gross i felt like maybe i could have gone without that but other than that just a great collection of uh avengers that then uh well used in this and uh yeah it's a blast Summer Shadows, number one from Dark Horse Comics, written by John Harris Dunning, art by Ricardo Cabral. Lots of stuff going on in this book, but the essential idea is there is a Greek island. There's something mysterious happening about it, and people are disappearing around it. And we're following a bunch of different characters who are investigating those disappearances in very different ways. Um, Like I said, I think there was like one or two stories too many going on in this issue to follow it because I really liked what we got initially. The idea of, I think this is the character on the cover who is looking for a fling that he had who wasn't into him the way that he was into the fling. Tracking him down, he's disappeared on this island. That's interesting. There's a good emotional hook there. But then we have a bunch of other characters and other aspects that are fleshing out this mythology that made it a little hard to hold on to. Yeah, it feels like two competing well-shot indie movies are happening in this comic. There's like this like cool Italian like, you know, melancholy romance thing with a little bit of thriller mystery to it. And then there's like literally like a vampire drama also happening. Uh, mm-hmm. It feels like, and like, I'm not saying they don't work, like they can't work when they do come together, but they feel super disparate. And they just happen to both be on the same beach. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, first off, intriguing cover, uh, very well done. Um, but I also Creepy. think that like the the art of this is really impressive there's like i think it's like the second page we get this like really great cool establishing sh- shot and then we have this kind of like person within a person image that was really well done and really artistically that impressive yeah. um that i was uh, really blown away w- with and then we get all these ideas happening but uh, the kind of the main story of this shirtless guy who never seems to put his shirt on, uh, you know, trying to find love. Uh, that's the definition of a shirtless guy. Honestly, he never is... puts his shirt on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I'm just, uh, you know, he, you know, he's still trying to find love. You know what I mean? You can't and find a shirt. A shirt. How are you going to find a love? You know what I mean? Yeah. Wait, you uh, think a shirt, you have a no shirt, no shoes, no service love rule? Like you uh, can yeah. find love without a shirt on. I think it's almost a help sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Depends who you're talking to. Uh, I am, I, just to be clear, I'm rooting for this series because I think there's like yeah. a lot of elements there. And I'm curious to check out the second issue to see if it really starts to come together because a lot of this is set up. The art, like Pete was saying, is really interesting and great. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot going on in this first issue. Let's talk about Spider-Man Reign 2, number three for Marvel, written by uh, written and drawn by Kare Andrews. Old man Peter Parker is back in time. He's met up with MJ, but she's Venom. And we get some big revelations to this issue. Uh, I'm going to say something that I rarely ever say. I think this comic is not good. Wow. wow. A pan. I, I like Kare Andrews' art. He has some good manga-inspired stuff. He's clearly channeling the Todd McFarlane era that's, throughout here. In a that's what I was going to say. Is like this is so, and honestly, that's pleasing. I like that part of it yeah. for sure. Yes, I love what is it like Venomosity or whatever the title of the issue is. Um, yeah. Seeing all of that, seeing the way he draws MJ, seeing the way that like he channels Todd McFarlane's narration and layouts and everything very impressive like he's a good creator i just think this story is actively not good well 
I think, you know, I sort of agree with you, but I think the original Spider-Man reign, the story was like just a little too bleak with not enough sort of heroic Spider-Man underpinnings for it all to come together. I think we're getting that here. It's just that there's even more going on. There's multiversity. Uh, so like, it's like the first reign, but a little messier. Um, so that, that feels like right. It feels like a very natural sequel to mm -hmm. any movie or a well, comic, what it right? feels like is dark knight returns was a classic spider-man reign was a big dark knight returns dark knight returns 2 was a god-awful mess and spider-man reign 2 is like let's ape that that seems like a mistake perfect achievement yeah yeah uh not to um you know jump on the bandwagon here but i'm definitely not having any fun with this the art is amazeballs and really impressive in a lot of ways um, and there's a lot of fun choices being made, but the, it's, these choices are emotional daggers for me to see MJ kind of making out with a flash venom instead of Peter and, um, you know, the making out. She kisses him on the cheek. Yeah, she kisses him. OK, what uh, what do you think making out is? <laughs> um, Ooh, loaded question. Yeah, all right, fine. The kiss on the cheek, whatever. It's not real making out, but wait, you say, uh, isn't it Eddie Brock? You mean Eddie, not Flash? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eddie. Uh, but anyways, um, uh, yeah, I, it's not. Um, yeah, and then he punches Miles. I was like, who's this fucking comic for, man? Like, uh, that actually, stop honestly, punching. is my like, big question. It's like, oh, is... you like this about Spider Man? Fuck you. You like this about Spider Man? Fuck you. You know, I mean, it's like, here, uh, whose uh, team clear, are you on? To be clear, I'm pretty sure Pete and I are not actually think the same thing, but at the same time, I agree with Pete in terms of. It's very similar to a lot of the weaker issues of Zeb Wells' run on Amazing Spider Man, where I'm like, mm. What is the saying about Peter Parker? What is the idea here? Because the idea here is like, Peter's gone bad. He is the bad guy here. He's the villain. What is the outcome? And we won't know that until the last issue. We have, I guess, three more issues to go. But it's not clear to me reading this what we're trying to say about Spider-Man in this comic. And Mary Jane's the ultimate venom. <clears throat> Great. Cool. cool. That's cool. That is very cool to me. Geiger, number six from Image Comics and yeah. Ghost Machine, art by Jeff Johns, art by Gary Come out. In this issue, Geiger's two-headed dog goes on a... Solo Mish, come on, man. Solo Mish finds a zoo where a bunch of mutated animals are and a bunch of hunters. I gotta say, I think this was the best issue of the series so far. Agree. And it's, it you know, you're, there's not a bunch of, not much of Geiger in this. <laughs> no, there's really not. But it's, it's slightly ridiculous because it definitely plays into Jeff John's predilection for talking gorillas. There's a gorilla yeah, with four arms yeah. who does some siding. And I was like, woof, talking gorilla. All right. Uh, let's roll with that. But good well, emotional it, story finding the two-headed yes. dog bonding with everybody in the zoo was yeah. great i was very into this yeah it was uh, great it's amazing what happens when you put the art first you take away all the stupid humans yabbing and yabbing and you really just kind of lean into what? storytelling yabbing uh, yabbing and yabbing yeah, yeah like we're doing i, was, I, I we're just literally think, yabbing yeah i know Fuck us. Like, this is just great. I love this. And uh, it was nice to see the two-headed wolf get some time. You know what I mean? Like, it's always about Geiger and his missions and the world. Can I but pitch you nice guys to... a podcast, by the way? Uh, Yappin' on Yavin. It's a mm. in-world podcast from Star Wars from people on the planet Yavin who are uh, taping it. Oh, great. oh, that's smart. I think people are ready to really get into some esoteric Star Wars territory without any of the main characters. That seems to be what everyone wants. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I agree. Uh, I I'm in. I agree. This is Sign maybe this is maybe the best issue of of this so far. But it is strange to me though. This, this comic feels like it's just spinning wheels. It's so much of Geiger just like hanging out, being sad, and then we get a, 
issue six is a standalone issue where it's just a wolf, two-headed wolf going around. I was like, what's happening? Dude, sometimes uh, but, people are sad, Justin, okay? I mean, I'm sorry if it's not entertaining for you, but sometimes people are sad. Yeah. Uh, I, I hear you mean the wolf, the two-headed wolf? Oh, I, I really do feel like this title has gotten new life since it moved over to Ghost Machine and yeah. they launched that proper. It's been much more intriguing. They've been pushing the story forward. I understand what you're saying, but at the same time, you got this Gary Frank art and you got this great fun one shot about a fun two-headed dog hanging out with a buggy. What's what's not to like? Yeah. DC versus Vampires World yeah, War V, up. number two from DC Comics, written by Matthew Rosenberg and Tyler Boss, Bergen. art by Otto Schmidt and Mikkel Morcho. We are amping up the war between Damian Wayne and the remnants of Barbara Gordon's Vampire Empire, as Barbara Gordon is dead, as far as we know. Meanwhile, oh, the humans are caught no, in the dead. middle. Oh, spoilers for the last issue. It's all right. And in the backup, we're getting some other stuff around there. Great revelations and twists in this issue, I thought. That's yeah, this is a banger-ish, man. I mean, amazing art. Um, you know, spoilers, but it was kind of really crazy to see Wonder Woman as this kind of vampire villain. Uh, you know, I was just like, oh, my God, this is heartbreaking, but kind of awesome. Um, plus Alfred just, oh man. Um, uh, yeah. Talk about, again, whole... this is a Pete stack. Yeah. Everything is for Pete. And this issue has a reveal that is the most Pete win you could ask for really. Respect the Butler motherfuckers. Let's go. I love this. I was just so hyped after reading this. Uh, this is just, uh, yeah, this is just kind of Get, get you really pumped this is such a great kind of high energy comic uh Berge and team is just absolutely killing this uh this is just such a blast p i wish you were alive in victorian england out there just respecting the butler really getting <laughs> that upstairs downstairs shit and flipping it on its end uh rtb as pete says um, this was butt. great what what respect the butt you yeah said? yeah, yeah. RTB, respect the butt. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really, really hold on to that one in my brain for uh, at right, least cool. the next forty minutes. This, um, this is really good. I like this event. Uh, I like this world. It is a little confusing that it's like vampires, vampires, humans, and their sides are all a little mushy. Uh, but I think there is That's a plan reality, here that man. we're gonna get to. It's reality. Yeah. Um, I wanted to shout out the backup, the Tyler Boss story, which is oh, super yeah. cool and fun. That's focused on Batmite. Batmite um, in a sort of weird. Uh, Batman. Very fun story. Well, it's got to be is. weird if it's Batmite, you know what I mean? Come on. Yeah. Good stuff. Fantastic Four, number 25 from Marvel, written by Ryan North, art by Carlos Gomez. In this issue, we're looping to the events of Blood Hunt. The Blood Hunt! Blood Hunt! As the Fantastic Four tries to figure out what Doctor Doom oh, is trying to do in Latveria, he has blocked it off with a dome. As soon as they touch the dome, they are sent to... Well, they think it's a bunch of stuff, but it turns out to be another universe where things have evolved in a very different way. Most of the issue is taken up with them trying to get back and Johnny Storm falling in love with one of the aliens. I love this comic. This is my favorite Fantastic Four run in wow. decades, maybe? Like wow. just Wow. Uh, for Are real, you, like including th- Hickman in there, including Hickman in there, because I think like Hickman really got Reed Richards. He really got Doom. He was like, I love Valeria. Let's throw Valeria in every situation possible. I don't know if he got the rest of them necessarily, but like that was his main focus. Ryan North gets all of them and gives everybody equal time. Yeah. Reading this issue where Johnny Storm falls in love with an alien who looks the most non-human an alien possibly can look, that's very consistent with Johnny Storm's character of a person who has fallen in love with aliens time and time again. He's a lover. He is, and I just thought that was great and really positive to see in an interesting way. It was a lovely romance throughout. 
add in that he's just expanding, he being Ryan North, is expanding on his delving into science that he got into with Squirrel Girl. He did a lot of STEM there. Here he's exploring some weird science concepts. Just great stuff. I love this book. Yeah, I, I mean, mean Sam, but... I I think this is a, a this is a just an excellent run. Run every issue is great and explores new territory for one or more of the characters. Um, I feel like the last few we've been doing some Johnny Storm stuff, which is great. Uh, and you know, I want this to continue forever. So let's do that. I mean, I don't know if Zoom Storm's getting enough love, but there everybody else seems to be getting some spotlights. She's here, invisible, but... Pete. They can't find her. That's that's not you know that's that's I don't like that as an excuse, but yeah you know Johnny Storm gets to have his bug life romance thing here and that's pretty sweet. Um, wow, and, Pete uh, dismissing the romance. No, yeah, hey I, man, hey man, Johnny Storm comes, he eats, he leaves. You know what I'm talking about? No, come on, dude. <laughs> Wait, Jesus is that a quote from Christ. Bugs Life? It is. Wow, yes. oh my God. Do you expect us to know that? <laughs> a, B, anyone else? I, I think I guarantee somebody listening to this podcast yeah, sure, gets sure. it when I says he comes. He, they come. No, it they, sounds. They po- whatever you're saying sounds pornographic. A yep. B. Purpose. If you listen, so. any listener, any listener yeah. who gets that, please write into us. Be <laughs> honest, because I just need I need to know that one person is on that. I'm part of that, and then I will let let it ride. Honestly, when I think about our listeners up here, they all look like ants. <laughs> Is that from yeah. ants? No, no, that's from a bug's life. Oh, wow. <laughs> really... Well, back to back bug's life quotes. Nice. I mean, that's just not even from. That's just how many more does he have in him? Say I don't know. Like right? But here. all I gotta say is it's I'm not... the youngest of one billion. Oh, now that's God. ants. Now that's we're getting into ants. Now we're getting. I actually don't remember whether he said one billion. But... Anyways, uh, you know, I I thought it was sweet. Um, the kind of romantic, you know, kind of talking about the moon and that kind of thing. I thought that was pretty sweet as far as the rom-com of it all was concerned. Uh, I was a little bit like, I don't remember Johnny Storm being able to create little planets that glow for his fire powers, but okay. Um, you know, uh, you but yeah. Mad? Ah. It's know. okay. It felt like a fairy tale. I'm all right with it. We're reading comics. If they want to expand his power a little bit to make something lyrical and beautiful, that's cool with me. Ag- agreed. Uh, uh, disagree. Disagree. Hmm. All right. Interesting. Dead Eyes, The Empty Frames, number one from Image Comics, written by Jerry Duggan, art by John McRae. We are following a... Man who is kind of a thief, but not really a thief. And in this new arc, he is trying to take back a bunch of stolen paintings and running into some issues there. Pete, you seem pretty stoked about this. Take it away. Yeah, I love this. This It's kind of a modern day Robin Hood type of thing. Uh, uh, It's great to have this comic back. I, I love the art style. I love the tone of it. It's just kind of this fun anti-hero uh, who doesn't give a fuck. And, uh, yeah, I I just have such a blast with the world that it creates uh, such a great mix of art and action. Just a solid-ish from start to finish. And uh, G motherfucking D, you know what I mean? Uh, talking about the Doug. Mm, got it. No, <laughs> no notes. Uh the John McRae art is so good here, and the just the design of of Dead Eyes in general is like really cool, and I, I yeah. like that a lot. And I think the stories, like the way that this tonally, this book is very uh, Jerry Duggan. That it's like there's a little bit of comedy to it, there's a little bit of violence, there's a little bit of crime, and it's such a nice approximation of those three things. Yeah. Red Before Black, number two for Boob Studios, written by Stephanie Phillips, art by Goran Suzuka. We are following two women. One of them is sort of a double agent, I guess is the best way of describing her, who has been tasked by the mob with killing this other woman. Val is uh, tasked with killing Leo, but she is working for, I think, the FBI at the same time. Meanwhile, Leo has stolen a bunch of cocaine, I believe, and is on the run for the mob and just tried Mm -hmm. to sell it. They meet up at a diner, this issue, and things get weird and fighty from there. I 
love this book. Yeah. I think like this might be one of my favorite two series that is coming out right now. Yeah. I think Stephanie Phillips is just nailing the characterization of these characters. Goran Suzuka is doing an incredible job of making dialogue scenes really tense and dynamic mm-hmm. in a way that mm-hmm. I'm not expecting. It's funny. It's perfect for if you're a fan of Criminal by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. Mm-hmm. It's clearly inspired by that, but takes it in a very new, very funny direction. Um, and there's a bunch of bananas, magical realism, weirdness that happens in both of these issues. Uh, the last page I'm just, of this issue was maybe my last favorite page we read this week. Would you, w- when you talk about bananas, are you talking about super tight bananas or are they loose? What, what kind of? Uh, mush bananas, which okay, is good well. for me because my teeth are falling out. Yeah, you, you, you yeah. need your Alex bananas, hates chewing, mush so mush bananas is high. Well, compliment. first mush off, bananas, mushy peas, cool yeah. ass title. Um, and uh, this is just such a fun comic from start to finish. The action, the twists, the turns, the art style. It's just a whole vibe and takes you on this really fun ride. Uh, it's Yeah, it's just, it's a blast. It's a great comic from start to finish. And I, yeah, I was just super impressed by this. I loved it. Uh, same, the, I guess, sci-fi fantastical elements that seem to be entering the story are really cool uh, and surprising. And it really, like, is working, I think. This reminds me to make a movie comparison. I feel like it's the two main characters are like a Michelle, a badass Michelle Rodriguez character hanging out with uh, Harley Quinn. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Margot Robbie is Harley Quinn. Yeah, totally fair there. Let's move on and talk about Amazing Spider Man number 57 from Marvel, written by Zeb Wells, art by John Romita Jr. Since this is an issue 57, just a reminder hit it on the number and the catch-up will come out easier. Pete, what'd you think about this? <laughs> oh, wow, dude. Oh, man. Uh, how long did you work on that? Yeah, uh, this just is... Just came up with it off the top of my head. I don't believe you. Uh, I mean, Romita oh. Jr. here, so the art's unbelievable. Um, yeah, uh, I think this is a good issue. Um you know, Tombstone making some moves, some twists and turns, and some reveals I don't want to spoil. But, uh, yeah, I thought this was a, um, you know, last panel reveal was fun. But, like, yeah, I just think this was kind of a fun, just Tombstone kind of like, it wasn't like this huge epic. It was a smaller story. So it was a nice kind of breath of fresh air here. I feel like Seb Wells has been doing just, like, very like it's almost like law and order episode style storytelling where it's like sort of very Mm. on the street in new york crime couple main characters there are twists in every issue and i'm like there's it's just very little spider-man action and like Mm. it's i like it it's just so funny that this is like the flagship spider-man book that is like sort of the least peter parkery of all spider-man runs that we've had in a while Two things I'll throw out there. One, the cover, why can't Peter Parker sit on a chair normally? That's pretty weird to me. Yeah, it is kind of weird because it's also this perspective of like how short is Spider-Man because he's on top of the chair and he's still below Tombstone and Tombstone is sitting. So like I got... Yeah, and I'm yeah. just kind of like, you know. I get the impulse there to be like, it's more dynamic to have Spider-Man sit on a chair in a Spider-Man way on the cover rather than having him sit on a chair. Regularly. But at the same time, it's like... It's jarring. jarring. It's yeah, a little it's jarring. That can't be comfortable. On the other hand, in the middle of the issue, there's an action sequence when they attack a transport vehicle with a subway train that yeah. I thought was very cool. Yeah, so I'm intense. I'm down on this run in particular, but there are still standout moments. You know, uh, Zeb Wells scripts some good stuff. John Romita Jr. writes and draws some killer stuff throughout. So, yeah, But know. it's tough if you're commuting in New York because when that shit happens, it's like, oh, it's such a delay. And it happens all the time. Yeah. Pete, what the fuck do you know about New York? Have you <laughs> ever even lived here? <laughs> oh, fuck you, man. Oh, yeah, I did. Johnny Quest, number two from Dynamite, written by Joe Casey, art by Sebastian Perez. 
The Johnny Quest crew has traveled forward in time to the future, and they've discovered a not exactly apocalyptic future, but a not great future. That they're trying to get away from. What do you guys think about this one? I think this is really good. I like you know a, a book that a book like this that pivots to time travel. I feel like can often be like, all right, but I actually think they're doing it really well here. And I, I guess I like Johnny Quest a lot. I watched it when I was a kid. <laughs> haven't really connected with it as a thing but it's a fun little group of characters here yeah just to jump in on the fun idea of it this feels like you know a cool app of the show this is a, a fun ish great art cool twists and turns and uh yeah uh good vibes uh yeah i was impressed you need to get someplace fast throw the johnny quest theme song on and you are moving oh yeah your butt is moving <laughs> The Uncanny X-Men, number two for Marvel, written by Gal Simone, art by David Marquez. In this issue, our makeshift team is facing off with some new mutants in the New Orleans swamps. Meanwhile, a bunch of other stuff is going on as we flash back in time to see the old romance of Charles Xavier's, as well as what is going on with Gray Malkin Prison which is formerly the Westchester School. So a lot more going on in this issue than the first one. I think we all uniformly really liked the first issue of this title, but what did you think about the follow-up? Well, it's, you know, you guys have kids, so this is a back-to-school issue that you guys got to really feel. You know what I mean? It's just like, oh, man, there we go. Kids are coming in. We're going to have to teach them. That's just how X-Men life works. But, uh, yeah, I thought this was... Um, Fun, a, a, a good time. Uh, I like the jubilation line. Uh, great art. Uh, Gail mm. Simone's really uh, writing the shit out of this. I love this. I, I, the Charles Xavier stuff I found to be pretty strange in this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you guys... Just like Charles himself. Well, uh, to get into spoilers, we meet back in the day when Charles was ex at school. He meets a blonde lady who is clearly seducing him in some way. Um, and then at the end of the issue, we meet a character called the hag who is taking children and bringing them or ostensibly children and bringing them to the gray Malcolm prison so that gray Malcolm prison can break them and turn them into operatives. I assume the hag and the blonde woman are the same person. Yeah. That's my oh. that could be, it was just as I. It was very disjointed. I felt like the first issue was such a composed issue, and this one I was like, "Oh, there's a lot of setup happening in this," mm -hmm. and we still get a lot of our emotional payoffs here. This um, issue, and I don't say this dismissively, is so Chris Claremont coded. Yes, I felt. that's such a great call. All of the stuff with Chase Xavier being seduced by the woman, I was like, this is straight out of a Chris Claremont classic X-Men issue. Multiple storylines going on all over the place. I, I think that's what Gail Simone is going for here. Like, she has yeah. her own writing at her own speed, but that definitely was present in the first issue. But like you said, it was a much more focused story. Here, we're getting so much set up for things going forward, like the classic Claremont, oh, we're all hot for each other all the time yeah. <laughs> sort of thing. That's that's such a great call. And it, honestly, hearing you say that, it reminds me that this issue, when they introduced the new mutants, uh, the outliers, I think they're called, yeah. um, reminds me so much of the extreme X-Men run that Chris Claremont did, where he was like, look at all these mutants. And they're like, hi, I'm Lifesaver, and I'm uh, the surfing one. And it was like, oh, here we go. We'll never see you guys again. <laughs> uh, but these guys seem um, like they're going to at least be involved in this story for a while. I mean, just because someone's crawling all over somebody and then kissing their forehead doesn't mean they're hitting on them, Alex. Well, if their Come shirt's on. off, it does, Pete, because I hate to keep saying it, but that's how it happens. <laughs> shirt's off. <laughs> well, shirts Kiss on, on the on cheek. This. It's on. Well, why don't we move on and talk about the domain number three from Image Comics, written by Chip Zdarsky, art by Rachel Stott. This is a spin-off of Public Domain, a story about making this very comic that you're reading right now. But here we're getting three characters who are sharing powers given to them by an alien. There's a bunch of alien mercenaries or killers or rogues who are hot on their tail. 
I thought this was the best issue of this title so far, um, because we're really starting to get into what I think is the point here in terms of, yeah. are these characters heroes? Are they villains? We've had the parallels all along with the characters we're seeing put together this comic in public domain, but this is the issue where it really stands out and becomes its own title. Yeah, shit goes down this issue. I mean, I love this issue too, but on the on the cover they made some mistakes. They had to cross out names and then write other names above it. So uh, I don't know who the editor is, but they need to get that together. Um, but yeah, I mean, fun line in here about the aliens beating up the law enforcement and... Um, uh, they're kind of like, oh no, we're we're not gonna kill you. Don't worry, no, we're totally kill, uh, cool. And they're just murdering people. So yeah, this is a lot of fun, a lot of action, some fun twists and turns. Yeah, this was a blast of an issue. Yeah, it feels like it's really taking flight a bit here as our heroes slash maybe one or more of them or villains are coming together and def- self defining a little bit more, and that's uh, good to see. Venom War, Wolverine, number one from Marvel, written by Tim Seeley and Tony Fleeks, oh. art by Kevin Walker, tying into the current Venom War storyline. We see the release of a bunch of zombiotes, which are symbiote zombies, yeah, we got and that Wolverine gets involved in that, um, leading to a reunion from his past. Pete, you seem pretty excited, so take it away. Yeah, I mean, you got to be fleeking Sealy over here. This is just some. Uh, this is just some fun. Nobody uh, knows what that means. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, cool ass cover. So uh, I'm already in. Yeah, I uh, interesting start here. Art is fire. Love it. A uh, fun book. Um, uh, uh, I think this is uh, interesting. I'm kind of uh, excited to see where this goes. I love that it took the um, the Venom War part of it and really tangented off, like found a way to make it a yeah. Wolverine story that touches on some con- new history, uh, a new little area for Wolverine to explore and bringing that as a more horror-type villain. Um, that is uh, coming through in this small town situation that he ends up in. I agree. Uh, you know, there were, I think, four, five issues from Venom War that came out this week, and I was really hesitant to put any of them in the stack just because it's a lot of Venom. But having this team on here, Tim Seeley, yeah. Tony Fleeks, if you haven't been reading it, writing and drawing local man one of the best books favorite book right now but ed and kev walker on arc that is great stuff and i just i love the tone here of wolverine being like uh it's another freaking venom thing no thank you get me out of here right now (laughs) it's very fun like there's a good amount of humor like you said justin i think there's a good amount of history as well and it puts wolverine in this position of having to deal with the situation but not being front and center with it um yeah yeah, it's a good emotional I, I agree with you, Alex. I really think the art brings a lightness to it, um, mm-hmm. which is kind Ooh. of a fun tone uh, with all this kind of goopy seriousness going on. So, yeah, I uh, yeah, this is uh, this is a great start, and I'm a, I mean, it's an unbelievable team. So I'm I'm excited to see what happens from here. Well, Hoppies. Green Lantern <laughs> number fifteen. Thanks for adding that, Pete. DC Comics. <laughs> Written by Jeremy Adams and Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Fernando Persarin and Montos, in the front story tying into Absolute Power, Hal Jordan is Song's ring, and he's trying to get some sort of power back. In the back story, we are giving a little bit of a coda to Green Lantern War Journal from that team over there. This is a great, to use Pete's phrase, package with a excellent front story, a fantastic backstory. Even if you haven't been reading Green Lantern War Journal, I think you can pick this right up. Philip Kenny Johnson does a great job yeah. of getting you caught up with the continuity. But goddamn, that first story, just Hal Jordan. Jeremy Adams has been doing an incredible jobs of delineating Hal Jordan 
not just from the rest of the Green Lanterns, but from other DC Comics characters. And yes. what he does here is separates him from the Bat family in a very specific way as he takes over their equipment and uses it because he doesn't have anything at his disposal. I thought this was just like a blockbuster of an issue. Yeah, I mean, I it's like- funny. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, like, I, I, I think this has been just a, such a sneaky great run uh, that we not enough people are talking about on Green Lantern. Hal Jordan is a character that started as like a a, a wild card. He's like a Tom Cruise in Top Gun. He's like brash, rebellious, and I think he's just been so softened and brought into like just another Justice League member like another Batman in a lot of stories that he's in. And I think Jeremy Adams is bringing him back to that roots. Like I, those roots, I love this characterization. I love how reckless he is. I, I think that the romance between uh, he and uh, star Sapphire on this is really great. It's just, a, I've been loving this in the backup. I think is a great job of taking all the stuff from the war journal that Philip Kennedy Johnson has been doing and making it being like putting a flag in it, being like, this is part of, <clears throat> excuse me, this is part of John Stewart's story going forward. Let's keep this and make it real. Yeah, I, I love this idea of, uh, you know, uh, going to the Bat Island there and raiding it for weapons and toys. So, uh, yeah, just kind of a fun setup uh, and well, very well executed. And yeah, just to echo what you're saying, backup was also really well executed and uh, such a great heightening of what was done in War Journal. And one thing I'll throw out there before we move on is there's so much going on in this issue and so many things that they need to balance from Hal Jordan stealing the bat stuff and trying to get his powers back to the Amazo robot that's learning to have more human feelings and heroic feelings from Alan Scott to Star Sapphire dealing with her ex-fiance who has turned into a super-powered supervillain. It's a lot But Jeremy Adams figures out a way to balance all of it and make it all work together in a really impressive way. Just great, great stuff. Yeah. Profane, number four for Boob Studios, written by Peter Milligan, art by Raul Fernandez. We are following the main character who has escaped from a series of fiction novels and come to nonfiction, a.k.a. the real world, and is trying to solve... I believe the murder of his creator, yeah. um, among other things that are going on in this book. It's just a great metatextual noir story, ably aided by Raul Fernandez's art. Um, good stuff. Yeah, I agree. I've been really liking this. Uh, I think it does that dance of a story and a meta story at the same time really well and to the point where we get uh some our main character like being like you know what i shouldn't be we wouldn't be normally having like a little sex break in the middle of this comic in the middle of this story but i'm going to do it because i actually love this character and i like that's that's really smart and a really good use of uh the the meta text uh, premise that this comic book has yeah uh i i'm a fan of milligan's work uh this is like everybody's saying, uh, meta, but amazing and fun and the twists and turns and the almost deaths. Uh, yeah, this this rocks in many levels. Let's talk about Ultimate Black Panther, number eight from Marvel, written by Brian Hill, art by Stefano Caselli. This is basically, for the most part, a big battle issue as Black Panther takes on the forces of Khonshu yeah. to try and save Wakanda Pete. What kind of do about that? Oh, fuck you, man. Oh, man, you really took the wind out of my sails with that one. Yeah, this is a solid-ish, cool-ass cover. You know, um, yeah, I mean, Kanchu gives uh, Black Panther a gift and stabs him in the leg uh, with a light and now maybe has powers. So, spoilers, but uh, some fun stuff going on and amazing art, badass action. Uh, totes package over here. This book is definitely a, an entry into the like, hey, we got a new metal. It does stuff. Uh, canon of this stack. Uh, but I actually think this works. This comic, I, I think our criticism of it has been it doesn't feel like it's really taking advantage of the ultimate nature of its premise. And I think it, this issue actually really does and is starting to deviate in a cool way from the uh, the metal in the leg 
uh, new power stuff to um, Storm uh, off doing her own thing in a cool way. The Oddly Pedestrian Life of Christopher Chaos, number 12 from Dark Horse Comics, written by Tate Bromble, art by Isaac Goodhart. In this issue, Chris Chaos is... Ooh, Chris! Nice first name base. Yeah. You guys know each other We've been together for 12 months at this point. He invites a bunch of werewolves to hang out with his monster club, and things go horribly wrong by the end of the issue. I really like this title i think more every issue by issue um it started a very esoteric but intriguing place and it continues to be that it's like one step removed from reality in both in terms of the dialogue and in terms of the pacing of the issues but we're getting more human and more connection between these characters and more stakes with everything as we go so uh, again good stuff yeah, I mean, yeah, ba- I got uh, badass uh, last page reveal. Uh, art is really cool. Uh, very interesting characters. The this kind of like monster squad setup is great. Uh, yeah, I love all the twists and the action. Um, uh, I I love the the kind of tone the art sets, and it's uh, very cool and creative. I, I just feel like it's a solid read. I was going to talk about tone as well. I feel like the tone, both from the art, like you said, P, and the writing, has just really settled into this nice place. I feel like the first, over the course of this first year of this comic, it's been a little bit, like, interesting stories, but it was hard to tell what the status quo was. And I feel like these last two issues have really just, like, solidified that in a cool way. You're really hanging out with these characters when you read it, and that's a fun place to be. Ain't No Grave, number five from Image Comics, written by Scotty Young, art by Jorge Corona. This is the final issue of the series about a woman who has been tracking down death in order to get a little more life and a chance to say goodbye to her daughter and husband before she passes away. Doesn't quite turn out how she thinks. Um, This was a great finale to the series. I think it... Uh, frankly meandered a little bit in the middle there but um it really tied up very nicely in a really big emotional way excellent issue it felt like this this last this last issue especially the end of it was maybe the first thing that the story grew out of like it's a really great Mm -hmm. smartly done ending and when the ending's great it really makes everything work um and great there's the last couple pages really Put bring it home. Ain't no grave? Question mark. Grave. Period. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. First off, one hell of a col- cover here. Just uh, so badass. Uh, yeah, this was a powerful ish, man. Very moving, violent, interesting uh, kind of combination there. The art is super tight, bananas. And the story is a banger. I mean, I highly recommend this. I agree with a little bit of the middling uh, that the Zalbatron was talking about, but the landing is so strong that it's uh, it's almost worth it. Wow! My, 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 my Corona back again, Rare twice in the stack from Pete. Exciting! Blood Hunters number two from yes! Marvel by Oh my gosh, Eric the Blood Schultz. Hunt! The blood hunt has begun again. Art by Robert Gill. We are following a team made up of Elsa Bloodstone, Hollow's Eve, Dagger, and White Widow, as well as kind of Miles Morales is sort of not exactly part of the team in this issue. First they fight him, and then they fight the Blood Coven, the evil opposite of the Blood Hunters. Pete, you seem stoked, so take it away. Yeah, man, the blood hunt is not over, and I'm excited to hear that still live in this comic here. And uh, yeah, you're clinging, you're clinging. I'm still enjoying the hunt, bro. Oh, I miss blood. Anyways, yeah, I just feel like we, yeah, we got a fun forming of a team here. It's nice to see a team kind of getting its groove, and uh, you know. Smoky monsters, uh, when not in a comic book, not as fun, but in comic book, very cool. So, um, yeah, it's fun to see the smoke monsters in the comic. uh, And, uh, yeah, I just feel like this is a blast. And, uh, yeah, I'm glad glad we're keeping the hunt alive here. It's in good hands. (laughs) 
I like these characters. I think Erica Schultz has done a great job of carving out her own area of the Marvel Universe that keeps getting better. I just would love to sit down and talk with her. Yeah, at some too point. bad. Oh, you can't I have great that news out. for you. She what? is going to news be on break? our live show. She could have been oh, on our shit. live show next Tuesday. Ah, so, there we go. so we great will talk news. To Late you breaking better. news at the bottom of the stack. Oh, my gosh. And that is the stack's. Hot Bottom Girls. What? We, I don't know. If you'd like to support this podcast, patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, Fat Bottom Girls? That's what I meant. Don't. What? Walk don't away, what? Don't no. Stop I will running. never. I will never walk away from anything. Patreon.com slash comic book club to support the show and all the shows we do. Go Apple, Spotify, Android, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at comic book live on Twitter slash X. Comic book club live on TikTok and Instagram, comic book club live.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the comic book club. Alex, respecting butts is Pete's thing. Remember, respect the butts? <laughs> yeah, That's his on, whole man. thing. Yeah. Respect it. Don't